I want to take a second and show my appreciation for this laptop that a kind subscriber sent me from Tulsa, Oklahoma. He wishes to remain anonymous. He's a re retired Army Master Sergeant. And uh, it was sent to me through his friends who happened to be coming through the area. So I did at least get to talk to them a while. Turns out they are subscribers to the channel as well. So it's always great to meet people that are interested in this kind of stuff. My main desktop is on its last leg. It takes forever to pull anything up. And, you know, I can access YouTube Studio in seconds now. Take a look at this. This mold was used prior to 1863 or 1862. Can't remember. As you know, I'm big in the history and, uh, Especially if it's got something to do with local history and foundry work. I just go nuts over it. I want you old-time foundrymen to give me your thoughts on what you think this might be. I know none of you would have been around in the 1860s or prior to that. But, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of traditions in the foundry, especially in your smaller family-operated foundries, get passed down generation to generation. So my guess is this was for metrology purposes. They were probably pouring test samples. Let me tell you about the history real quick on this. Uh, I've always been fascinated with the AB Reading Foundry in Vicksburg, which was pouring bronze guns. They were popular for the reading rifles. According to the guy that I bought this from, he, he's the one that actually found it. He gave me the exact location where it was found and no disrespect to him but after i started researching it more i mean he was certain this came from the ab reading foundry the more i looked into it the more i concluded it came from the am paxson foundry which was also there prior to the war as a matter of fact paxson and reading were working together on a lot of projects Needless to say, both the Reading Foundry and the A.M. Paxson Foundry were both leveled from cannon fire, and uh, they no longer exist. And as far as I know, this is the last remaining artifact to exist from those foundries, other than the two Reading Rifles. And one of them is on display in Vicksburg, and I forget where the other one is. I don't know what this material is. I don't think it's plaster. I don't believe plaster would hold together in the moist ground for over a century and a half like that. The K, <laughs> you know, coincidentally, this is only about two blocks from Kilroy's building. My guess is Kilroy's ancestor was carving Kilroy was here, and then the Union bombed the crap out of him before he could get past the K. I came in the mail yesterday. I wanted to show you guys what Donnie Terry sent me from Sooner. For those of you that don't know, Donnie Terry is one of my subscribers, and he and Sooner have been very generous to help me with what I need to do my grind and clean up with. Sooner is a German company. They make very high-end tools. It's stuff you're not going to find on the shelf at your local hardware store. But I was telling Donnie about the 12-inch straight edges, or, you know, I'm having difficulties grinding the windows out. Uh, for some reason, it's, it's a lot harder flashing than the 9-inch straight edges. And traditionally, the burr would be ideal for this, but that will eat the burr up. So I'm having to grind these windows. I was telling Donnie last week that the grinding wheels that I was using on my grinder, I had purchased you know, from Home Depot, they were disintegrating in no time. And do they have something that's a lot harder material that'll hold up? So he sent me all these. They are a quarter inch, and I have several different sizes to choose from. He also sent me some flap wheels. They're uh, 40 grit, rated at 20,000 RPM. If you can see that. Along with some flap disc, if you're having to prep it to paint or... Uh, after a good splattering weld job, as you guys know, I'm, uh, I rank among the highest in welding. While they were at it, they went ahead and supplied me with some more of the turbo disc cutoff wheels along with their magic disc grinding wheels. Now, I've said this before. These discs 
do, along with the uh, grinding wheels, they don't glaze over like your off the shelf wheels normally do. These are very aggressive cuts, something that's always appreciated, especially in the kind of work I do. And for you guys who do a lot of production grinding, cut off, it doesn't matter if you've got a body shop, foundry, welding shop, check these guys out and see what they got to offer. They may be able to save you some money in the long run because of the durability of their wheels along with their power tools. Okay, I took the shell off of the muller. It was leaking sand, as I said, right here, here, and then the door. You know, I got it off again right now. This was not seated down on this table properly. If you'll look here, you have a step, and it was never, it was probably an eighth of an inch from actually properly seating, which was causing sand to come out here and here. So I've cleaned these out pretty good with the water propelled wire wheel, fixing to put some grease around this rim and try to get it to seat properly. And we'll get to mulling some sand. I'm going to skip the greasing step. I don't want that thing to pop off of there when this thing is running. I think I better put my door and hinge back on first and that'll let this line up good. Go on, Wasp. I do not need his assistance. All right, so let's, let's move that out of the way. And it is hot out here, super hot. I'm gonna snug these up and then tap on the end of these bronze hinges to make sure they're pushed in enough. All right, so I got it, I got it spun right. So now I gotta figure out how to get this thing seated. That's working. back here that makes that front end rise up and we don't want that set crack and see this gap there I don't know what to do about it I think the uh, can is bent so with that said, I'm just gonna smack some goop on it on the inside, stop that crack up. I was hoping when I pulled this can off, cleaned out all the uh, undercut, it would uh, fall right in place, but that's not the case. It is currently 105 degrees out. I'm gonna knock off for now and uh, cool down a little bit. And then later tonight, hopefully it'll get down in around 90 or below. And <laughs> which I would love right now. And we'll finish this up. Trying to stop it in the right spot. Oh. Yeah, get enough. doing a lathe tail stock today. This is a split pattern and <clears throat> this is the core box. All right so we got we got one little issue nothing major. To make the core box you want it the length less than the actual length of the prints. This is a little longer which is no big deal 
there's two ways around it. I can either not ram the core quite as high in the box, or I can ram it up all the way to the top and then dig out on the core prints and extend them a little bit. As long as I don't damage this print, I can dig a pit out here on each end of it like a little well, just for clearance for the additional ends on the actual core. So like with anything with cores, we're gonna start on that part first where it can be drying out in the uh, kiln. For those that are not familiar with what a tailstock is, I'm gonna show you. Along with this, we also have to cast a riser block, and that's gonna go up under the headstock. I know 90% of you that follow me are machinists. I just, I know that. For the 10% that aren't, that are not familiar with these machines, I'm gonna show you real quick what a headstock and a tailstock uh, are along with a headstock riser. Okay, so this is a tailstock and they're on lays along with the headstock, which is right here. Now, I'm not sure what this guy is doing. My guess is he's making a taller tailstock than his existing one in order to increase the radial path or his uh, turning diameter on the lathe. With that said, he also needs to make a riser block to raise the, the headstock up. So, uh, what we're going to be making is the rising adapter for this part of it, along with a new tail stock, which is extra tall, in order to accommodate that larger diameter swing. I don't have the first clamp. Every single one I've got, I took to my dad, and we're going to have to uh, tape these, and it won't damage the box or cause any uh, issues. I'm going to put two wraps. I'll hit it in three places. Keeping the box tight. That's just as good as any clamp. I'm going to zero that out. Let's go to 300 grams. Eh, 200. 200 is good. All right. I'm gonna roll this bag up and get depress all the air out of it. And basically, what we're fixing to do here is just mull it. We're just doing it by hand. I'm going to put this rod down in the middle. Once we get the first layer around then, I'll center it and then I will keep it up here to the top. Now we're going to put our little rod, I'm going to lean it over a second just to find my middle. Before I start mulling sand, I need to make a decision on how I want to put my risers in. I'll probably put it there, one here, and one here. We're going to start off with the side with no dowels. Man, it is hot, 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 hot.
I always put the flask, I always put the cope on before I dust in case I have any side current of air. It doesn't take most of it away. I want to make sure that doesn't stick. And I'm breaking one of my rolls already by dumping this sand from such a high altitude. I'm hammering the parting dust out of the way. Now what I'm doing here, I'm backing everything that's so awkward right now because it could tip over. I'm going to use my little wonder stick for ramming this down because I got these obstacles in my way. It's taking up a lot of room and the big rammer will be bumping into them and everything else. I'm just going to firm this sand up. Alright, I got it stable enough now. I'm going to use my small rammer. Alright, I think that should stiffen everything up. I should have cut those dowels off. Something told me to do it, as always. And I said, no, maybe this time it will stay in the mold. And it will, of course, just float right off of that. So glad Sooner sent me all those wheels. I'm gonna need them. This is our risers. We're gonna connect those. We're going to put a runner right through here. I'm going to extend it on out. This is going to feed the bottom of this riser and this riser. We're also going to go ahead and gate it. And the runner is right here. So I'm going to cut. We're going to feed into that trap right here. We're going to cut one wide gate here where the other riser is. Remember I said we needed to extend the length of the core prints. I'm going to do that now. I'm just going to cut a little well on each end because that core is longer than the prints. Make sure that... Yeah. And I will have to do the same thing on the coat. So that's going to be more than enough room. Everybody recognizes my wrapping tool. Go check out uh, Perry S.W. Dweeb. I, I, I always forget how he pronounces that. But anyway, uh, I, I'm going to list it here. Check out his channel. Uh, in, his lace, in his latest video, he molded up a uh, wrapping tool. 
and it looks great. He, it turned out really good. Check his channel out if you haven't already and take a look at what he made. I'm wrapping it more this way and this way and this way than I am this way. And that's because of this small dam of sand. I don't want to break that off. All right, let's see what happens here. I believe that's it. I will say this customer uh, does an excellent job on his patterns. Zoom it in a little bit here. I should have plenty of light. You get them, Jake. And it's still hard to see. But there is a very small, frail ledge. And I'm going to just round that over, making a radius there. And I'm going to do the same thing down below. Well, Dollar, it's about time you get here. I'm not going to even ask where you've been. Yep. Eh. Boy, that's a geyser of water, isn't it? <laughs> well, I can hang that up. I'm going to go ahead and grab the bellows. That'd go. Mr. Pete, give me this. I'm going to put three vents. Right. I'm going to put one here. Should have just went with two. I have to be very careful right here. Don't want to break that off. Well, I didn't catch a mistake I made until I was editing this video. But uh, as you are going to see, I'm going to assemble this mold and completely forget to put the core in it. Uh, Mind you, I did go back in and pull the mold apart and place the core in it, but I didn't get it on video. And that'll keep the June bugs out of it. Well, uh, we're not going to have a pour tonight. Uh, it'll be on the next video. I've got a lot more molds i got to get made up. I've got a bunch of 12-inch straight edges. Now look, wait for Keith to announce that they're ready, and then you'll know. Uh, keep your eye on Keith. When he makes that announcement, whenever it is, then we will have them ready to sell. They are not ready to sell yet. I've got to get a substantial inventory built up of those before he announces it. And uh, he's wanting to, <laughs> I know he does. I cannot get hit with 150 to 250 paid for orders breathing down my neck all at one time and me not be prepared for it. So I'm not, I, I can't sleep at night when that happens. 
so just be patient with me as I build up to that inventory. I figure if I get 150 in stock, then it'll be safe for him to announce it. Um, but I want to have that many boxed up and ready to ship before he says, okay, they're for sale. Uh, and that way, I think the, the surge, I'm hoping that's the max amount of surge we get. And then from there, we'll get trickle down orders and I can steadily keep up with them. But uh, I, I, during the nine inch straight edges, we figured we'd have 50 in stock, uh, go ahead and announce it, and boy, did we mess up. <laughs> so I don't want to get caught like that again, and uh, we have reason to believe we're going to be selling a whole lot more 12s than we did the 9s. So uh, please be patient with me. Uh, I've had several people sending me emails wanting to know if they're for sale yet. Not yet, uh, but keep your eye on Keith. Once he announces it, uh, it's open market on them, so uh, I appreciate your patience in the meantime. And there was some people asking me about my the uh, Windy Hill Foundry angle blocks. Those are not going to uh, happen until we get all this production work for the other guys that I'm obligated to do gone. Uh, I mean, yeah, I want, I'm die and hurry up and get those going as well but uh i'm one person guys so just uh take it easy on me this week has had its challenges i uh, i get up with a group of friends once a month or when we can and uh that killed one night this week and then uh, my daughter i took off yesterday to have dinner with her and her husband. I haven't seen her in forever, so I didn't. That's two nights there that I wasn't able to work out here. Uh, between and and honestly, as hot as it has been, <laughs> it's it's just been miserable. I'm not what I used to be, so I have to pace myself these days. I guess that's about it. Uh, it is going on ten o'clock. I got a lot of I gotta spend some hours late tonight just getting this video together where I'll have it loaded and have it available tomorrow. So, so I guess so I guess we'll cut it off right here, and I'll see you next week.